So how many of you have a personal leave policy? I'm talking a written, a, a, a structured policy that your employees know to rely on, maybe even to look at, to, to review before they even ask for a, a personal leave. And remember, a personal leave is time outside of the need for medical. We're not talking um, sh American disabilities time. We're not talking about FMLA time. We're not talking about short-term disability time. We're not talking about workers' comp time. We're talking about somebody who wants to go out for educational reasons. They want to finish their, their last year of, of um, college. They want to go, um, they're, they're going to move. They need time to just move from one residence to another. They, maybe they want to leave and, and go adopt a child overseas. They need a month or two to do that. Someone who maybe needs to go through a divorce and some time off to settle through all that stuff. Um, sabbatical travel. I want an extended vacation. I need personal leave. And I know I may not get paid for it, but I need some time off outside and above and beyond PTO and vacation. What's interesting is um, I run into companies all the time and they don't have anything like this. And if they do, it's, it's very vague. So what I thought we'd do today on the show is go through some of the content, some of the, the meat of what a personal leave policy should look like. And let's see how close your current policies are to it. And, and hopefully, I'll give you a couple suggestions of things that you need to add and maybe some things to consider because you're listening to the human resource. I sometimes forget to add that. I, I need to add that. Like you don't know who this is. <laughs> oh, okay. So if we're talking about a personal leave, what's the first thing we should consider? Well, who's eligible? Are you going to just make it available to the, the new hire that hasn't completed their introductory period? Are you going to offer it to part-time people, temps, seasonal people? Or is this going to be exclusive to just full-time people? Eligibility is important. Don't leave it wide open. And it's very, very reasonable to limit it to just your full-time regular employee. That's quite all right. Remember, this is a benefit. So there you go. Think about that one first. And then how do you want to be notified? Is this something that you want? advance notice on two weeks, four weeks? Do you want it in a formal uh, manner? Do you have an actual formal form that you use? Or is this something that can be sent in an email, a text? Is this something that your supervisors can approve? Or for a personal leave of a certain duration of time, say, more than two weeks consecutive. Is this something your senior leadership should be aware of prior to approval? I've got one client that he'll let him let his um, management approve anything up to two weeks consecutive, and anything more than two weeks consecutive, he needs, as the owner, needs to know what's going on. Well, we'll talk in a moment about why, and I like that policy. So think about that, if you have that in your, your language. What about blackout periods? Are there times when your business is so busy that you just can't approve more than two weeks or, or even more than a week consecutive? Because that's appropriate. Retail establishments, especially during the Christmas holidays, during those periods where they're so dependent on business, you just can't have some of your key people, or maybe you can't afford anyone to be off the floor for long periods of time. And then what about time limits? Is it unreasonable for your organization to allow people to take more than four, six, eight weeks of time away? And how much notice do you need for that? Do you, can, is that something you can approve with a one-week notice in an email? 
Or do you need a six-month notice and something in writing? Okay, and then what about paid or unpaid? You know, if you, if you have me work on your PTO policy, I'm going to always recommend individuals take paid time prior to unpaid time. Meaning if they've got unused or accrued PTO or vacation and they're asking for a personal leave, we're going to apply any of that outstanding PTO or vacation to that leave. Now that means that they're going to exhaust it and when they come back they won't have any left for their own personal choice. But most of the time this personal leave is their personal choice and vacation PTO is there for their use. So think about that. Are you going to allow a personal leave to be unpaid if they have the accrued or or earned unused PTO or vacation available? And then I always like to ask a company, are you going to require the employee to communicate with you at some point within this period of time? Let's say they go to another country to adopt a child and they need at least six weeks. Is it reasonable and would it be helpful for that individual to just reach out, maybe nothing more than an email or a text, somewhere in that four to five week range to say, hey, things are going as planned. We have all intentions of returning and I should be back at work on this particular date. This is a good practice to have on medical leaves. Why not apply it to a personal leave of absence? Nothing unreasonable about it. And then here's the big one. Are you going to secure their job and hold their job for them while they're out on leave? Now think about that. It may be dependent on the individual and the impact they're having on the position, on the company. It might be easier to hold a job for a CFO than to hold it for a cashier because we can replace the cashier faster than we can replace the CFO. And we may not want to replace the CFO because they know so much. They, they, they've pretty much built the company or they keep the company going or they have the relationships with the banks. The CFO has a different impact on the company than the cashier. And when you're talking personal leave, Unless there's a state law stating otherwise, there may not be any requirements to secure that job. And then the last one I want you to really think hard about is, are you going to continue benefit accrual for that individual while they're on their leave? And what I mean by that is many companies say, you know, every pay period you accrue this many PTO or your vacation after you've been here six months, you get so much uh, vacation. Are you going to allow that in- individual to continue accruing vacation when they're really not actively working? How are they going to continue paying their medical premiums? If you have an employer contribution and there's a balance paid by the employee and yet on an unpaid paid leave, there's no compensation transaction through payroll, how are you going to collect their side of the premium? And if you're going to have a payment plan, is that something in writing? Is that something that you can wait to the end? You need to think this stuff through. And I would highly recommend putting as much of this in writing as possible. So if we can put this part of the 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 personal leave policy together. Also, it's very, I mean, it's, it's just good practice to be transparent in what considerations you will weigh your approval of the personal leave on. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> the reason of the personal leave could certainly have a, a, a deterrent, determining factor on whether you approve it or not. I want to go and adopt a child across, you know, across, across the sea, or I need to take care of a, a, a parent who's terribly ill and it's going to be a lengthy period, six to eight weeks. 
versus the individual who says, hey, I just don't want to work for a while, and I think I'm going to go backpack in Europe for a while. Is that a good enough reason to hold their job? Is that a good enough reason to keep them on payroll, keep them on your benefit plan? I would also tell you to consider who the individual we're talking about is. Again, is it the CFO who has this very important job who's a major decision maker for the company versus the cashier, someone who comes in and works for hours and, and leaves, uh, doesn't necessarily uh, have the relationship with our vendors and our banks? Is it somebody who's been with the company for 30 years who, without a doubt, you want to take care of because they've helped build the company, they've been the, a loyal employee versus the person who's only been there for nine months. Those are That's a good criteria. That's, that's very reasonable to, to think about in considering the approval of a long-term personal leave. What about the availability of how to fill that position? The CFO is going to be a little bit more, I mean, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, but I'll bet you your CPA can step in. I'll bet you your controller can. Maybe even the CEO can take care of things for the next six to eight weeks until the, that gentleman gets back. But a cashier, yeah, we may just have to hire somebody. Hire a temp, hire a seasonal person to, to step in if you feel that it's a, a, a reason to let the uh, employee take off a leave for six to eight weeks. And not all personal leaves are that long. We know that, but... You do get those requests every so often. And then use the performance. It is totally okay to tell somebody who wants two or three weeks of personal leave or an extended vacation to say, no, you're on a corrective action right now. Your, your attendance has been subpar. I, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable giving you extra time off. You need to be back here and you need to be working. That's okay. But are you using that as a part of your consideration? It's kind of like promoting somebody. Somebody who comes over and says, hey, I want to be promoted. I, I'm tired of working this job. I want to go over and work that job. But it just so happens they're on a performance evaluation, so you have the right to say, no, I'm not transferring a problem. You, you have an attendance issue or you've, you've got a performance issue, no, I'm not, I'm not going to promote you. I'm not going to transfer you. I'm not going to move you. Stay where you are. Knowing the reason for a personal leave, knowing what somebody's trying to accomplish, and then making all the considerations, weighing it up against the business needs, you know, what, what impact is this going to have on our company? Can we afford to have this individual out? How long is too long? Those are good things to think about. But the most important thing about a personal leave is document, document, and document. Document why they wanted to leave, when they wanted to the time that they wanted to take off, and then why you approved it or didn't approve it. Look, it's it's important to give your employees time off, but if the company can't afford to do it, the company can't afford to do it, and you do need to be consistent. But those are my suggestions. Because you've been listening to The Human Resource. Hope that helped.